Hey everyone, this is the Family Docs Podcast, brought to you by the California Academy of Family Physicians. And I'm your host, Dr. Raba Sibe, CAP's new physician director and associate program director at San Joaquin General FMRP. Welcome to another episode. Now today, we're going to be delving into a critical issue, rural family medicine and OB deserts. According to the World Health Organization, maternal mortality has seen a global decline. But shockingly, the United States experienced a 26.6% increase from 1990 to 2015. Today, we'll hear from some incredible family docs working in Northern California who have first-hand experience with these issues. Dr. Amanda Mooneyham, Dr. Laura DePaolo, and Dr. Landon Hagee. We'll explore the alarming statistics, the challenges faced in rural medicine, and the joys and obstacles encountered by our guests. Dr. Mooneyham's recent California Academy of Family Physician magazine article on Trinity County OB Desert sets the stage. And Dr. Hagee will share his journey from Reading to practicing rural medicine, including prenatal and postpartum care. Our conversation will touch on the joys and challenges of rural medicine, the struggles faced by physicians unwilling to provide prenatal care, and Dr. Hagee's decision to practice in rural areas. We'll also discuss the vital role of residency training programs in fostering interest and preparedness for rural practice and OB care. As we wrap up, we'll issue a call for action, emphasizing the need for family medicine in rural areas and the incredible quality of life that comes with it. You are not just part of the healthcare system. You are appreciated, needed, and can practice the full scope of family medicine. I'm really glad you could join us to hear from these incredible family docs as they discuss this critical issue. As always, you can find more information and resources mentioned in this episode in the show notes or at familydocs.org backslash podcast. I'm Dr. Rob Asibe, and let's dive into a chat on rural family medicine. Welcome, everybody. My name is Dr. Amanda Mooneyham. I am an associate program director at a residency program in Shasta County in Northern California, and I have here with me two of my colleagues that I would like them to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura DePaolo. I'm a family medicine physician practicing and teaching in Redding, California, and I actually grew up in Redding. Uh, in rural Northern California, and then was gone for many years practicing in more urban areas of California in the San Francisco Bay Area and San Diego uh, before moving back to Reading in 2019. And I'm currently um, one of the faculty members at the Family Medicine Residency Program in Reading at Mercy. And I'm uh, Landon Hagee. Um, I am a rural doc up in Modoc County, for those of you joining in. Uh, that's the far northeastern corner of uh, California. We have more square mileage um, than we do have uh, people in the county. So um, it's, great to, it's great to be with you all today. I'm excited to talk. <clears throat> So we, we're really excited to do this episode because it touches on our biggest passion, which is rural medicine. It's one of the reasons why we choose to live in Shasta County and Modoc County. We are a huge catchment basin for um, Trinity, some of Lassen County, and all the areas around us as well. So um, I was first introduced to rural medicine by being born into it. So I don't know if you guys know, Laura and Hake and Landon, that I was actually born at a critical access hospital in Trinity County. So my um, ties go way back. My grandmother and my mother were um, raised in Trinity County, which is a very small, like mountainous region just to the west of Shasta County. And all of the um, babies were delivered by family medicine physicians there. 
So um, it, it was the normal practice. They had their C-section training during my residency training. They had surgical backup with the general surgeon who lived in the area as well. So most of the babies were delivered at the critical access hospital in Trinity County up until about 2002. This is when um, state regulations made it very difficult for the hospital to meet their standard of care, and eventually they had to decide to close their labor and delivery floor in 2002. Um, after that, I um, went to medical school at UC Davis and eventually settled with residency training in Redding, California, and I love delivering babies. So this is a huge passion of mine, and I hope to share it with all of my trainees, including Landon here, <laughs> who I, I was fortunate enough to meet um, as a faculty member at one of our residency programs in Shasta County. And I um, will let him tell his story about how he got into rural medicine and what are the things that he enjoys about practicing in rural Modoc County. Yeah, thank you. It's good to see you again. <laughs> I was born in a motor vehicle five minutes from the critical access hospital in Alturas, California. I'm actually working with the doctor who saved my life that night. It's kind of a cool, cool story. My mom wrote me a letter when I was, I don't know, five or six when I started reading she read that letter to me about the night I was born. And I remember growing up as well. My my grandfather was a doctor in Cedarville, California, which is a town of 500 people as opposed to Alturas, which is 2,800 people. And he practiced there for many years. And growing up hearing stories about the relationships that they had with the community members and, and the help and uh, support they provided with the, the people there kind of motivated me to say, hey, maybe medicine might be a thing for me. I went on a service mission for my church when I was uh, 18 years old, found that I liked helping people too. So then I met an awesome spouse who supported me and helped me go to medical school after she went to law school. And we wanted to be back close to family. So I found my way back to Redding, California, did my family medicine training there. I just graduated in June. Dr. Mooneyham helped me a lot and trained me a lot with, with uh, deliveries and OB care. And I wanted to, I knew I wanted to do rural medicine again from a young age. I have kind of that, that blood history with my grandpa. And then Dr. Rickard up here is the doctor who saved my life 30, 35 years ago. And it's really cool to be able to, to come and say, hey, Dr. Rickard, I'm a doctor now too. Uh, I have some questions for you. And he, he's always there to <laughs> provide some answers or support. And he also, he also comes to me and asks me questions now, which I'm like, oh man, you're, you're my doctor, right? Like, but it's such a rewarding experience to come back to an area where you grew up and to be able to provide health care and expert advice to the people that, that kind of knew you as a kid. At first, I was a little worried about that. I thought maybe they'd remember me as this kid who would just run around playing soccer all the time, but they respect the, the fact that I left and then I came back and I just want to help the community. It's been a very cool two and a half months so far since, uh, since I started up here, but really, really loving it. Landon, can you tell us a little bit more about what your practice looks like now? Yeah. So I wanted to go to residency in Reading because I wanted to get rural training. I may have a little bit of ADHD or maybe I just have a personality that likes to do a bunch of different things, but I wanted to do prenatal care. I love delivering babies. Um, unfortunately, up here, uh, I'm not able to do that. I, I wasn't C-section trained during residency and we don't have a full-time anesthesiologist or a full-time surgeon up here, so I wouldn't have backup. But I love doing prenatal care, postpartum care. I love newborns and what my care, what my, my job looks like up here. I work in the SNF. So our skilled nursing facility it has 50 beds and I'm one of uh, four doctors who works there in the SNF and has a patient panel. I work in, as a hospitalist in our critical access hospital. So we have an eight bed hospital and I work um, typically five, 10 hour shifts um, every third week. And then the rest of the time I'm in the clinic with the added benefit of having a week off scheduled each month. Um, so time-wise, it's pretty cool. I don't, I don't have any call. The ER is run by uh, a, a group of actually uh, Ventura Family Medicine faculty members, and they do a really good job running the ER, but I, I don't have to take any call. I'm done at 5 or 6 p.m. every day, which is completely different from residency life. So I'm really, really enjoying that. 
But I do as broad a spectrum care as I could. Like two weeks ago, I did a paracentesis on an inpatient patient that we had. I did a circumcision last week in the clinic. I've done joint injections and aspirations. And as an osteopathic doc, I get to do OM, OMT as well. So I feel really well supported here. We're starting to do point of care ultrasound here since that was a passion of mine in residency. So anything that I, I say, they're like, yeah, let's try it. We, we just want to make you happy and we appreciate you. So yeah, that's awesome. It's so great to see the full spectrum care that you're providing um, as a graduate of, of the, these programs in Reading. And just to back up a little bit too, I think it's really cool that we were all delivered by family medicine doctors. <laughs> I was also delivered by, well, general practitioner here in Reading 40 years ago and awesome. <laughs> at Shasta General Hospital, which is no longer here. But um, that was part of the reason that I decided to go into family medicine as well was just, you know, seeing the practice that he had growing up. Um, he delivered me and my brother. He performed my brother's appendectomy, <laughs> <laughs> wow. did colonoscopies, uh, really full spectrum care. So he was an inspiration to me to go into to family medicine for sure and to come back and practice in this community. Um, I was down in San Diego for a while um, and it's totally different providing care at a big tertiary center and it was really eye-opening coming back up here uh, in 2019. I took a job out in eastern Shasta County in Round Mountain, a very small community but that health center provides care to a lot of Eastern Shasta County. And those patients were so grateful, like you said, that I had decided to come back and that they could have a doctor in their community where they live and not have to drive two hours um, to see a physician or um, to get prenatal care. So I think we should uh, talk a little bit more about Amanda's article recently in CAFP in the newsletter that she wrote about obstetrical deserts. And Amanda, can you tell us a little bit more about your interest in the topic and what you found? Yeah. So I, I feel like um, this is a topic that, you know, we hear about, but we don't see, right. It's just sort of invisible or it appears on a sheet of paper, you know, really like see the visible effects that it has on people's lives. Well, in Shasta County, we see it. We, we've seen, labor floors, you know, close in our neighboring counties, in our neighboring area. And so I have prenatal patients who drive incredibly long distances just to see me because they intend to deliver in a hospital that has, you know, some, some advanced level of care. There are critical access hospitals in Shasta County outside of our catchment area, but they don't deliver babies because they've had a hard time meeting um, state standards for care. So they had to end up closing. I actually experienced the closure of a labor floor during my residency training at Fall River Mills in um, eastern um, Shasta County, and um, all of those patients had nowhere to go. So, you know, it, it, it is kind of a conundrum having to set very high standards of care in obstetrics when the, res the ultimate result is that people receive no care at all, which is really unfortunate, or having to really go out of their way you know, to find, you know, appropriate prenatal care. So um, I ultimately have patients who have driven as far as um, Willow Creek, which is the next county over to the west of us, all the way over to about Fall River Mills, which is to the west of us, and east of us, I'm sorry. Um, so that's a huge fan of geographic area. The roads themselves are not straight freeways. They are very tortuous highways. Um, they're not the safest to drive on and, in, and they're often blocked with construction. In the wintertime, they have um, access issues with the weather as well. Um, we don't have a lot of snow plows here, so when snow happens, um, the road's closed. It, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, I actually, you know, asked a few of my paramedic friends in the area and just about what their experience is with having to transport patients in the weather and how often that they do field deliveries. And it does happen, you know, more often than not. But the the one alarming thing to me was that there are no, no like state standards for paramedics because ultimately they're the ones that, 
you know, might encounter a, you know, emergency in, you know, very isolated areas. Like they're not required to do neonatal resuscitation training. They're not required to do advanced life support and obstetrics, which, you know, what if they had a shoulder dystocia, you know, while doing the field delivery, that is going to be ultimately very scary situation to be in. Um, so that's kind of what I sort of envision for the process, like in the future, is to um, train physicians who are in obstetrical deserts to do like also of course advanced life support and obstetrics and to train EMTs to be ready for any medical emergencies, you know, that may come up as part of um, obstetrical care. But I do want to kind of talk a little bit about what prenatal care looks like in rural areas. So, Laura, you mentioned earlier that you worked in Round Mountain. What does prenatal care look like there? Yeah, there currently is no OB care available in that area. There's no OB provider. There are family medicine nurse practitioners and family medicine, well, I was the family medicine doctor that was doing prenatal care in that area, but now I'm in Reading. So as far as I know, there's not currently a family medicine doctor in that community providing any prenatal or postnatal care, postpartum care, but there are some nurse practitioners that will still see prenatal patients and postpartum patients, and then they have to transfer their care down to Reading when they get far enough along in their pregnancy, or if there's any sort of high risk or complications, they transfer them immediately. And it's really hard for the patients. I had patients in Round Mountain that were driving one to two hours, same thing on dirt roads sometimes, or snow covered roads, just to come to the clinic, let alone if they had to go all the way to Reading or to Mount Shasta to see a doctor was really hard for them. So It's definitely an OB desert sort of situation, and there's there's consequences for that, for sure. I had a a patient who delivered at home and then was pretty much lost to follow-up. So, you know, I think that the maternal mortality data in this country is pretty well known, and it's, I think, well known that... The U.S. has terrible maternal mortality statistics and that it's increasing, but I don't know if it's as well understood how the lack of access to care and how these OB deserts are contributing to that. But those of us that practice in these rural areas and have seen firsthand the challenges that these patients face can understand how the lack of access is really contributing to the maternal mortality rates in this country. So, Landon, you said that you are providing prenatal care up in Modoc County. Where do your patients ultimately deliver if they can't deliver at your critical access hospital? Yeah, um, we have five different areas people will go to. The closest labor and delivery unit is uh, in Lakeview, Oregon. It's about 50 miles north of Alturas, the, the county seat. And there's Two family medicine OB trained physicians there who who do deliveries there. Um, some maybe like a third of the patients go there. Some patients go to Klamath Falls, Oregon. It's an hour and a half away. They have an OB um, practice there, and then they also have a family medicine residency up there that they train a couple of residents each year to do C sections under an OB um, physician at the hospital. So a lot of people go there. Some people go to Susanville which is an hour and a half south of us. Some people go to Reno, which is three hours south of us. And then some people end up going to Reading. Um, And really the only option for people whose insurance dictates where they go and are very complicated is to go to Reading, which is two and a half hour drive. And it can be pretty pretty rough and, and tough. It's hard for many of the patients here. So Modoc County historically has had a lot of government assistance for, for the, the people who live up here. It's a, it's a low cost of living. You can buy a house for really cheap up here. So if you want to come up here, that's that's a, that's one of the, the checks. We, we have a pretty poor population, um, financially speaking. And a lot of people have one car for their family of five people. The husband will be working on a fire, and we'll have to use that vehicle to travel. And so then the mom with the kids stuck in town or the car isn't super 
trustworthy, it breaks down and, and they can't go anywhere. It's really difficult for many of them to even afford gas to travel these far distances. So up here, we, we provide prenatal care up to the second trimester. And because of the training that I had uh, at my residency, we could do pre prenatal care for more complicated patients with the assistance of partnership. They, they do telehealth consultation for um, perinatology, which is really nice. We love telehealth. Be cool if we could have a telehealth anesthesiologist and a C-section robot or something up here, right? But <laughs> that's not uh, that's not anywhere in the future. Maybe maybe in like thirty years we'll have that. But yeah, because that was you just answered my next question was what if they have a complicated pregnancy? Like what do you do, right? That that's a fantastic option for telehealth, you know, for perinatology. I was speaking to my colleagues on the coast, so in Eureka, and their patients often have to travel all the way down to San Francisco. But that's a good, like, three or four-hour drive for them. It's, it's quite a distance. Wow. We, yeah. In, so in Reading, we are very, very lucky to have a part-time, you know, MFM in, in the area. It is, it is very difficult to provide the level of care that we want to you know, for all of our patients. And I think that kind of speaks to the broader issue, just lack of specialty care. So yeah. that's kind of the, a little bit of another question I have for you, Landon, too. Like, how do you navigate specialty care in, in such a remote area of California? Oh, that is a question that I'm still learning the answer to. <laughs> I'm lucky to have some really good mentors up here. And so I can ask them, I can say, hey, like, who do we normally send this person to? So here in Modoc County, most people go shopping in Re in Reno, Nevada, or Medford, Oregon, just for like state sales tax purposes. So a lot of people don't end up going to Redding very frequently. Also because the mountain passes between here and Redding, when it's wintertime, they're closed with snow. They're almost impossible to drive drive through. And you can get to Reno easier than you can get to, to Reading. And so a lot of the patients that have been establishing with me are patients who have, you know, 20 different medical diagnoses. And they a lot of them have like not followed up with their specialist that they had 10 years ago. And now that specialist is retired. And so now I'm in the process of trying to figure out like, okay, like what did they see you for exactly? because we're in the process of switching to a new EHR program. And before that, they switched like eight years ago. So we don't have like long-term records on many of these patients. So I'm trying to kind of piecemeal their histories and say, oh, you went to the rheumatologist and you think you had rheumatoid arthritis. Well, are, is that rheumatologist's office still open? Luckily, I have a care coordinator who's assigned to me and I can just say, hey, can you call this office? And they're really, really helpful. I and the patients who they're still seeing their specialists, it's because they have access to a car. They can get down to Reno. We have a, a bus service called the Sage Stage that goes down to Reno like once a week. It goes to Reading once a week. So sometimes that can help people get to their appointments, but it's just one one day a week. It's really difficult. Like, I'll give you a story. I think. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I was going to say, I think that this is one of the main challenges for those of us providing care in rural parts of the state yeah. is the lack of specialty care. Because even if your patient from Alturas makes it down to Reading, yeah, where's the specialist? At? <laughs> we don't have a rheumatologist here. Yeah. So um, then they have to go to Sacramento uh, or Medford. So these patients can be traveling two or four hours to see a specialist. And it makes it really challenging for the providers too. I have a patient that I just saw this morning who is on a bunch of meds that were prescribed by her rheumatologist who's retired and now they're prescribed by me. But I think it's just, you know, as a family medicine doctor, we don't always feel well equipped to be a specialist and a family medicine doctor because we know a little bit about everything, but we don't know enough about everything. So um I think it is one of the big challenges also for recruiting people to come work in these areas. Yeah. You know, family medicine can fill that gap for sure, but we still need support from specialists and our patients still deserve that level of care. So it's one of the biggest challenges for recruitment and for us to practice in these areas um, and for our patients too. 
yeah. to be able to get that specialty care that they need. And having to go two to four hours to receive it is a huge burden on the family and the patient. Yeah, it's <clears throat> the nearest orthopedic doctors are like two hours away. Had this kid who broke his ankle the other week that was like a Salter Harris type two. And they came to me and they're like, what are we supposed to do, Dr. Hagee? And I said, well, we need an orthopedic doctor. And they said, we don't have a car. <laughs> and I said, well, son of a gun, <laughs> let's let's figure something out. So I called some people and sent some x-rays. Yeah, I, I think it takes a unique unique doctors to, to, to want to come to rural areas and provide care. It takes resiliency and kind of takes thinking outside the box sometimes. And I learned that from both of you during my residency. <laughs> I think part of the the joy of it, though, like you said before, is just uh, getting to give, you know, that opportunity to contribute back to your community. All of us grew up in these rural parts of California, so we really have grown up seeing the need and um, how much there is to contribute to this area and how much people really appreciate that, too. So it does bring a lot of joy to be back yeah. in this area and, uh, you know, being part of the solution. Yeah. But it's challenging for sure yeah definitely challenging but def definitely rewarding I, I i love it laura you mentioned like the joy of being in a rural area and i think one of my favorite things and you know providing prenatal care to the mom and also seeing the dad then delivering the baby seeing the baby and their siblings like it's just so magical to get to know each patient and like their whole family, you know, like the kids, the grandma. I don't know. I think maybe just because of how far out from residency I am, like I found that sweet spot of, you know, where family medicine really is and where like you can really get the most of joy out of it is just taking care of the whole family. And you don't, you don't often get to see that. Even in residency training, you only have so many continuity clinics. You're only there for three years. You don't get to see like the little baby grow into you know, early childhood and I have some that are becoming teenagers so it's just, it's just so fun like seeing the whole transition is it's part of why I, I love family medicine but especially rural areas I mean you see them in other places and other walks of life you know I see them at the soccer field right when my kids play soccer it's just so fun to share not just you know your lives in medicine but your lives outside of medicine as well for me it's a uh, really rewarding to to feel like such an integral part of the team right so i have a lot of friends from med school who are all <laughs> um telling me about their uh practice and a lot of them are in big cities and they just say yeah i feel like i'm a part of a, a cog in the wheel of medicine up here if i say hey this might be a cool idea they like do it next week right because they're like we want you to stay we need you so you really feel like you're you're heard and listened to, and that's such a rewarding aspect, I think, too, of, of working in a rural area. The community needs you and appreciates you, and the clinic or hospital you work at, like, definitely appreciates what you do. Yeah, I totally agree with that. <laughs> the the difference between my practice down in San Diego and then in Round Mountain, it was such a stark contrast of how quickly we could get things done <laughs> if somebody had an idea. And that's part of rural medicine is being innovative too and figuring things out, like you said, thinking outside the box. So, you know, we could just come up with something and then in a week we could do it. Yeah. And it was like in San Diego, there were, you know, 40 different things and 40 different people you would have to check with and processes and operations. And, <laughs> and then, you know, the idea would be like, Oh, never mind. By the time, <laughs> by the time it got through that process, so uh, it was, it was really an interesting contrast to come up to Round Mountain and then to, and even in Reading, and be like, "Oh, I have an idea. We can actually do that, yeah. and that will help our patients. <laughs> like that's amazing. I don't have to wait three years for approval. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and it's true. You do feel like you're needed, and. Um, and that you're an integral part of the health system up here providing care. So that is rewarding. I agree. So I wanted to shift a little bit and um, kind of put a little focus on advocacy work. Landon, you had the opportunity to be an advocate. Can you tell us a little bit what that role was and what you ended up doing? Yeah. So 
Dr. Lupeka, my program director during residency, my first year in 2020, came to me and my fellow intern class and said, hey, does any any one of you want to do any advocacy work? And my wife encouraged me to, and I was like, sure, I like talking to people. I didn't know what I was signing up for, but it was a very rewarding experience. So I got to be the resident representative for the Northern Valley Medical Association, which is a subsection of the California Medical Association. And I got to go to their House of Delegates meetings. The first two I went to were virtual meetings. And then the last one I went to was was in person, virtual during COVID. And as a part of that, we got to, you know, I met with senators um, to discuss the adverse effects of the physician training license that it was having on, on resident training in California. And as a, as a consequence of some of our advocacy, they, they changed that rule. We still have our PTL license, but we can get a full license for U.S. trained medical um, students after 12 months and then for international medical students after 24 months. And that's a, a big boon because we were seeing some some medical students not choose California for the residency training because they couldn't moonlight because of PTL issues. And that was just one thing. And then I got to stand up in front of like 500 doctors and advocate for a specific change in one of the uh, policies that we were advocating for on a state state law level. And they agreed with me, which was kind of a, a fun experience. But going into residency, I didn't know I'd like advocacy as much as I did. And and looking ahead, when I really want to see change in the medical field, like I'm going to do my best to help my patients here, but to to change insurance policies and the wonderful prior authorizations that we run across every day, that takes advocacy work at a state and national level. Um, and and being up here having a week off each month, I have I have extra time to to be able to pursue some of those passions and really, really enjoy enjoy that. So any any med student we have that comes up here from like University of Reno um, or residents who come up here, I always talk with them about advocacy because that's that's really how we get to have a voice again in, in healthcare. So our organization with California Academy of Family Physician is um, largely into advocacy work. That's what we're built for, right? So I, I do want to leave a little bit on this episode on a call for action on um, what we can do for our um, colleagues in rural areas and also on how we can advocate for improvement in prenatal care in obstetrical deserts. Um, You may see some um, uh, advocacy work and policies that come up in terms of getting access to care and changing state regulations in order to make um, prenatal care a viable option at critical access hospitals. So um, that would be my ask is a, to improve training in um, in the rural areas, not only for the physician, but for EMTs, ER docs, anyone who um, can encounter the pregnant patient um, to not only offer prenatal care, but to be prepared for emergencies that may come up. You know, they can happen anytime, anywhere for our um, pregnant women and be able to have access to that care is going to be incredibly important. So that would be my call to action. I want to ask if either of you, if you could ask for anything in medicine, and especially in California, what would you ask for? I think one thing that comes to mind on that is that residency programs, family medicine residency programs, need to continue to provide in-depth training in OB. Just in the time from when I was a resident until now, ACGME has changed their requirements for OB training of family medicine residents, and it's it's less and less <laughs> OB training that's required, and that's not going to help solve this problem of obstetrical deserts that we're facing in this country and the increasing maternal mortality rates in this country. Having less people able to provide that care is not going to help. So, I think that's one of the challenges is that maybe residents don't always feel prepared by the time they graduate from family medicine residency to continue providing prenatal care, postpartum care, and OB care. And so I think family medicine residency programs also need to step up, and not just the rural programs, but all of the residency programs, and 
and advocate that this is important if we're going to solve this issue of maternal mortality rates in this country, then we have to have trained physicians that can provide that care in rural areas. And, you know, I think it's the statistic is that only 7% of OB providers practice in rural areas. So that may not be the solution. (laughs) We have to fill that gap with family medicine. So part of that is training enough physicians to be able to provide that care, whether it's obstetricians or family medicine doctors. Yeah, I was going to, I was, I will echo uh, what, what you said, Laura. I would have loved to have the opportunity to have C-section training during residency and, and our programs up in Reading, like we're really robust and strong and, and OB training for family medicine, but a lot of the other programs down South or in bigger areas, you know, the family medicine residents are kind of put on the back burner. They're like, Hey, there's the OB resident. They're going to, they're going to do the deliveries. You can watch this one. But in real life out here in these rural communities, you know, if, if somebody comes to the hospital and I'm on a hospital shift and they're going to deliver, I'm going to run down the hallway and I'm going to help because I have that experience and because there's no OB here, right? So I think that's really integral to advocate for these hospitals and, and resident training sites to, to really train us to, to do full spectrum care uh, like family medicine has done in the past. And then also to touch on like physician burnout. I'll do I'll do a little shout out for burnout level where I'm at. Like it's really rewarding to practice medicine in rural areas. And there, I haven't read studies about it, but just looking at the different counties in California and Nevada and Utah that I've kind of visited, the, the doctors who practice in rural areas have less burnout because they feel more involved in like the healthcare decisions. And I if you want to come up here, like they'll give you a week off every month. You only work a certain amount of time, you know, I'll do a little recruitment for Modoc County, but um, any county up here, we, we need doctors. And just, I think another thing um, that, that Northern California is trying to work on is to get like a medical school in, in Chico or even Redding. How cool would that be, right? To get a medical school in that rural area that can then feed that area with future doctors. Because if we could do that, we'd get them exposed to the community and exposed to what we need. And I think it'd be really beneficial. So advocacy from the state in the state of California to say, hey, put a medical school north of Sacramento so that we can start getting more med students involved in how cool rural medicine can be, um, I think is is another thing. Yeah, I I actually have some statistics on that that you had mentioned there's less burnout. Um, So 25% of rural respondents reported burnout compared to 37.5% in medium-sized town and 50% in metropolitan areas. So the studies are there, does support that, you know, um, people who um, practice in rural areas have, you know, higher levels of satisfaction in, in their work that they do. And I, I can I can see it for you, Landon, too. You know, you're <laughs> yeah. not burned out at three and a half months yeah. out of residency. I don't have the bags <laughs> under my eyes anymore. <laughs> but yeah. Okay. So... Um, I'm thinking that we could wrap up with this episode. I so thank you for joining me to talk about obstetrical deserts and life in rural medicine. You can find more information to resources mentioned on this episode, including links, bios, and more in the episode show notes and at familydocs.org slash podcasts. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great talking with you both. Thank you. Thank you, Drs. Mooneyham, DiPaolo, and Hagee for that important conversation. Now, you can read Dr. Mooneyham's article on OB deserts and more on the focus on rural family medicine in the fall issue of the California Academy Family Physician Magazine at FamilyDocs.org. The Family Docs podcast was developed, produced, and recorded by the California Academy of Family Physicians. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent or the California Academy of Family Physicians. Until next time, this is your favorite family physician, Dr. Rob Asibe, the CAFP.